Hi, I'd like to start off with a story. It involves an elephant in the room. I had an argument with my supervisor. Maybe this sounds familiar. I'm training to be a clinical psychologist and I was doing a placement with older adults, assessing them for various forms of dementia. As part of this assessment, we give them a battery of tests, one of them being a memory test. We read out to them a list of words and we ask them to repeat them back to us as many as they can. We then score up their results and compare them to hundreds or thousands of other people in their age group and see how they do. People who have dementia tend to do more poorly on this kind of test. So now it's really important to pay close attention to what your client says. There's a form of dementia that manifests as progressive loss of language function. Some telltale signs involve subtle articulation errors, so it's really important to listen carefully. You'll understand why in a moment, but I was in the habit of audio recording my client's responses so that I could review them later with my supervisor. And then one day, we had a disagreement. The disagreement was about what the client had said. Because these words fall into categories, one of them being animals, you expect to hear words like lion and tiger, so you're primed to listen out for them. I thought I had heard lion, but my supervisor said that she had heard something else, and that would have been an incorrect response. We listened to the tape several times. I persisted, because I'm stubborn, and she insisted. But there's one other piece of information that you need to know here. I have a severe to profound hearing loss. I wear two hearing aids. With them, I have closer to a mild hearing loss. But without them, I hear nothing. Up until this day, I knew that my hearing wasn't as good as other people's. Granted, I've never had anything else to compare it to. But up until this moment, I had thought of it or framed it as, I simply just don't hear as much or with the same richness as everybody else. I never thought that I could so vividly mishear something. That day, I was forced to confess that my hearing was fallible. I have a disability. Certainly much of the time it doesn't feel like a disability, and to most it's an invisible one, but here I was, facing undeniable evidence of a clear impairment. And I was quietly shaken up by this incident. It took me some time to process it. And the more I looked back on it, the more I started to see my day-to-day -day experiences and challenges in a different light. What I found was that the impact of this incident started to deconstruct these notions of self-sufficiency that I had hid behind. I had built up this perception of myself as being just fine and just like everyone else. We all have our own narratives about ourselves. Mine just involved doing whatever I could to cover up my disability. To pretend it wasn't there. But in the wake of being disillusioned, I began to see things a little bit differently. I would acknowledge and recall how I would go out to dinner with my friends and colleagues. I had trouble following the conversation. I felt left out of social situations, but I wouldn't say anything. In the classroom, I had difficulty following along. But again, I didn't say anything. If I missed something in discussion, I would just be quiet and not put my hand up so I wouldn't repeat something that was already said or say something tangential. And I didn't want accommodations in school because there was no problem. I eventually got so good at this pretending that I forgot I was pretending. And for a while, this actually worked quite fine for me. And then I started graduate school. And in graduate school, the classrooms got smaller, the material got harder, and I couldn't just go look things up or figure it out on my own if I missed something. And I'll try to explain to you what it's like to listen with hearing loss. Let's give you an example. Let's pretend it's a Friday night and you and your friends go to hang out at a coffee shop or a pub. It's noisy, it's loud, and maybe there's some music playing in the background. And to me, the music maybe sounds like this. So 
it's no dinas loud and you're having a conversation and maybe you miss a word or two here and there, but in general, you don't really notice. You can make up for it. You can fill in the blanks. Now I want you to imagine that and that it's a little bit later, so it's louder. And your friend just switched the topic of conversation to something a little bit more serious. So, and maybe you're talking about politics or philosophy or how much Justin Bieber looks like Miley Cyrus. And now listening requires more effort. So not only are you straining your effort on trying to hear what the person is saying, but you're also straining your effort on trying to follow what the person is saying too. And that's a lot harder. And for me, it's like that a lot of the time. Even it's something as seemingly simple as footsteps clacking in the hallway. And just to give you another simulation or example, this is what a sentence might sound like to me. The police returned to the museum. I've been able to compensate most of the time, but eventually the demands of the situation exceeded my abilities to cover it up. And I noticed this was happening more and more often. Class participation was suddenly a very substantial proportion of our grade. I had Skype lectures that I couldn't follow. I had therapy videos for assignments, but I needed subtitles. Otherwise, it's like watching a foreign film without the subtitles. You can make out the general plot, but not much else. But it wasn't until that simple confrontation with my supervisor that I became fully dislodged from my denial. And the shattering of that illusion made me realize that all of this denial and avoidance and minimization has a cost. And that cost is shame. Hiding from my disability meant that I was ashamed of it. And the more I hid it, the more ashamed I became. When I was younger, my difficulties hearing and my crazy, crazy hair, thanks mom, meant that I was subject to some teasing. And, and I was self-conscious. People saw that I was wearing hearing aids and they would come up to me and they would ask me, are you deaf? Thinking that that didn't make sense. I asked them to say it again. And again they would say, are you deaf? What these naturally curious five-year-olds with poor articulation skills really meant to ask was, are you deaf? I instead felt perfectly embarrassed and ashamed and do whatever I could to escape that situation. Perhaps like any eight-year-old would. But here's the thing. When you're embarrassed or ashamed about something, your entire demeanor, your attitude, your disposition, all of that changes. And people notice. And they become afraid to ask you about anything because they don't want to embarrass you or cause you any discomfort. And this is quite unfortunate because people are naturally curious. And you know, so many of them just avoid making the first move because they don't want to, they don't want to miss stuff. And this creates a feedback because the more shameful, more shameful I felt, the more distance I put between myself and others. This meant that I felt even more ashamed and created even more distance and an even greater gap. And the more and the more I did, the less I was asked. The more my teachers and supervisors bought this notion of self-sufficiency, the more I believed it too. You know what? There's a piece missing here, and we need to acknowledge it. We need to understand how this sense of how this sense of shame and how that operates in a larger societal scale. And here's what I realize. It's not just that I didn't talk about it, but it's also that we as a society in general don't talk about it. There's a lack of systemic education about disability and awareness in schools. So this place is the onus on you guys as individuals to go and seek out these opportunities. And they often don't happen very naturally. And so not only are we left without a common frame of reference, but when we don't talk about something, we assume that there's a reason for it. Right? So not only does silence create these gaps in knowledge, but silence begets shame and stigma. We assume that we're not supposed to talk about it. 
and it becomes a shameful secret. Even if it's something that's staring you straight in the face. And the other consequence of the silence is this and this perception. So why is it that when I contact a doctor of psychology asking for subtitles for educational therapy videos, I met with the response of, we don't have them, okay, but perhaps we can use headphones to boost the volume. Well, you should think, when, you're, when you have trouble hearing, it's a problem of volume and clarity. But my supervisor has said, if you're short-sighted, we can make the room brighter and brighter and brighter. That doesn't mean you should be able to see it more clearly. So even if the most educated amongst us is misguided about how to accommodate individuals with disability, this suggests that there's something very fundamentally awry here. And this lack of shared knowledge and accessibility <coughs> means that the burden of advocacy falls squarely on the shoulders of those who are most vulnerable. As a student, I felt that I constantly had to advocate for myself and what I needed in the classroom. And at times, I felt that my requests were met by challenges from my instructors who questioned whether I actually needed these accommodations. And you know what? This is frustrating for me because unlike my parents or my sister, my hearing loss isn't noticeable. I don't speak any differently than the average person. But I need the accommodations nonetheless. And because I was too embarrassed or ashamed to speak up for myself, I didn't feel like I could advocate for myself as much as I needed to. And you know what? Hearing loss may affect us all at some point in our lives when we get older. And difficulties hearing, being deaf or hard of hearing, it's not just about being unable to hear. A hearing impairment affects your ability to communicate, to engage in social situations, to participate in society. And all of us, you know, we might feel a diffuse sense of responsibility. But we all have to do our share to help fill in these gaps of silence. What would happen if we opened ourselves to difficult conversations about disability and acknowledged about this burden belongs to each of us. What would happen if we answered each individual call to negotiate a comfortable place for disabled individuals within our society? What would happen if we taught disability education and awareness in schools? I don't know all the answers, but what I do know is that one measure of society includes how well it treats its most vulnerable population. Disability does not have to be handy. And so what can we do? Well, the good news is that if shame and embarrassment is an unintended consequence of not talking about something, then instead of ignoring this bit of dangling threat, we can instead be a gap. We can disentangle shame and disability by talking about it. And, you know, this doesn't necessarily have to be an overly serious conversation either. Because we can achieve these. We can achieve this in ways that are both compelling and humorous. And I'll give you an example. Not too long ago, in the blistery winter, I was driving three friends of mine to the movies. The car was parked along the sidewalk. I got into the front seat. My friend got into the passenger seat. I started driving. I hadn't gone far at all. And then I turned around to make a remark about the movie they were about to see. And then I noticed that the back seat's empty. <laughs> at the same time, I see that the other two friends are walking towards the car. And they're like, what happened here? Well, apparently I missed the part of the conversation where I was asked to pull the car forward a little bit because there was a snowbank blocking the entrance to the back seat. <laughs> see, it was dark outside, and I didn't see. And in order to speak to me, I need to see you because I read lips. My friends know me very well. They know that. But sometimes, even they forget. But it was a funny situation, and we all laughed. We all learned something from it. And you know, these opportunities come up all the time. But we're afraid to engage in them. Because maybe you don't want to remind somebody of something they want to have to talk about all the time. So if you do this, you get the awkwardness out of the way in the first minute. Move past the possibility when you see the person. And you also liberate the 
other person from the preoccupation of wondering if you've noticed they have this ability or what you're thinking about. And then you find that the elephant in the room was a lot less than you thought it was. And in the end, it doesn't matter where you start. Start anywhere, as long as it's somewhere. Ask questions and be curious. Be honest with yourself about your discomfort. Because it's normal. We all have it. And don't be afraid to treat us like you would any other person. And for those of you on the other side, you know, whether you have a disability or you're dealing with something else that maybe not everybody knows about or knows a lot about, as we've heard today, do your best to honor this curiosity so that we can encourage conversations and understanding. Share your experiences. Connect with people. Be proud of what you can offer. And I won't lie to you. Doing this, it may not be easy. And I can tell you, it certainly has not been easy for me. But that's exactly why it matters. Don't underestimate the power of a single human interaction. Because it was one person and one conversation that led to a sequence of events that compelled me to come here and speak today about something that I never thought I'd be able to so openly share. And we all do this. We all play our part. The next time that eight-year-old just might be able to have that conversation.